I'll sort of give it a brief introduction to what I'm doing here in the first place. Um, I have three hats that I wear. One is as a data scientist at a global South think tank called Learn Asia. We function across about 17 countries. Um, the other is as co-founder of a fact checker called Watchdog, which I think is primarily why I'm here. And the other is as a science fiction author. So there may be points where all three of these personas seep in, so take what I say with a grain of salt. After all, I am a fact checker and I have to caution you against myself. So. Let's start with Watchdog. Uh, we are a fact-checking operation that was launched in the wake of the April 2019 bombings in Sri Lanka. 259 people died. It was initially 350-something, but uh, the coroner's office wrote back and said, sorry, there were too many pieces of people to identify, so we had DNA-matched body parts to each other, and we reduced the count by 100. A friend, uh, friend of mine was there when the first bomb, the first hotel bomb went off. Um, he's Instagramming. You see body parts and people being flung out. Uh, that was rather interesting. So we decided to do something about it because the government response to this was radio silence. Um, and in the space of this, there was significant misinformation that started circulating in WhatsApp and across Facebook. For example, there were rumors that um, certain people have poisoned the water supply in X place. And I would get a call saying, is that true? By the time I called journalists over there and said, is there any truth to this? There would actually be vans going up and down on the road saying, don't drink the water. The Muslims have poisoned the water supply. And meanwhile, mobs are circulating uh, outside my friend's house. So this is not a fun place to be. So we started a fact-checking organization. Uh, we hit five. So I have to say, Colombo. Sri Lanka, well, Colombo, the city, is a very small place. It's kind of like Riga. It's about a million people tops when most of the workforce are actually in there. So on the first day, we hit 5,000 users. We hit 10,000 users in a week. Uh, we are now at slightly over 70,000 users on the whole platform. Um, that's kind of what we do. This is a very simple JavaScript front end. Initially, it was hooked up to a Google Sheet. Um, well, that's Watchdog. All of this, the, this was a fact checker that we built in 36 hours, and we scaled to 100 volunteers on the back end, checking misinformation. And well, we're now serving 70,000 users. People think we are national heroes. I always say that we need better national heroes. But this is the Watchdog tech stack. So on the front end, we are, like I said, a JavaScript app, something that could be written simply and cleanly in 36 hours of coding. So it was God knows how many Red Bulls, uh, I think about 10 packs of cigarettes. I measure time and effort in cigarettes. What we actually do is so we've now expanded since then, which brings me to why I'm actually giving this. Um, we then, we defined ourselves from the start as low-level information warfare operations because what we were seeing was not, it wasn't that Sri Lanka didn't have fact checkers. It's that they weren't effective enough. It's that by the time a piece of information flows through WhatsApp and the rumor mill comes together, by the time someone fact checks it politely and cautiously and writes it in very nice and meaningful language a week and a half later, that, that whole thing has passed. Uh, so we now monitor, as part of our monitoring toolkit, we monitor 11,000 Facebook groups. We uh, started off by monitoring 300 WhatsApp groups. We have now expanded. We have listening posts on all, almost all major platforms. We scrape YouTube, we scrape Facebook, we scrape Instagram, Twitter, the whole nine yards. We have uh, content scrapers checking local gossip sites. I'll explain what those are. Uh, we have what we call passive surveillance, hooking into WhatsApp and Telegram. And uh, towards the end, which is now what I'm working on these days, we're trying to scale up our approaches because we started out with 19 people in the core team plus 100 volunteers. We still have the volunteers. We work on these cycles, we onboard people. But it turns out people do burn out. And this is a free service. This is, a, you know, all of us are volunteers essentially doing this. We're now down to two humans. Uh, one of the 19 had a mental breakdown on the first week of operation. Turns out too many body parts, videos, whatever. Uh, so we, we are experiencing significant human attrition. I'm trying to plug in the gap with machine learning. So let me sort of explain the Sri Lankan ecosystem. Oh, that's our logo, fighting bullshit in the digital age. Um, so let me give you a small introduction to what the Sri Lankan news ecosystem is like. Firstly, we have this phenomenon of what we call gossip sites, which is basically yellow journalism. It's a staple of the news ecosystem of Sri Lanka. It's actually larger than investigative journalism, and it's actually a part of traditional media operations as well. In fact, uh, Gossip Lanka, Lanka C News, Hero News, Hero Gossip, Divaina, these are some of the most visited websites in the country. Once you 
you know, look through Alexa, take out the search sites, take out the porn sites, then you have these sites. Politics in Sri Lanka, after all, we just came out of a 30-year civil war. It ended in 2009. Um, are largely race-based. Uh, there's a lot of race hatred going on. That's how politics have been since, uh, well, we kicked the British out and since the 1956 Single Only Act. A lot of our politics and politicians have been defined by ethnic groups and how these groups interact. Thirdly, we have this strange feature of very high connectivity. We have 104% oversubscription on sims, so we have more sims than we have human beings. We have almost perfect national coverage with uh, at least 2G and 3G networks. High-speed broadband, however, came to the public somewhere around 2012. 63% uh, of Sri Lankans aged 15 to 65 said they'd never actually used the internet. But we did these series of surveys called After Access. Lanisha uh, did a series of national representative surveys across 22 countries. Uh, in India alone, we did 4,000 face-to-face interviews. And one thing we found, particularly in South Asia, was you'd go to people and ask, do you have the internet? They'd say no. Do you have Facebook? Yes. So we're not really sure about that number because what we've seen is that we have a highly connected populace. We have fake news almost as an intrinsic part of the media ecosystem. And then you have the internet coming in and several generations of services just being available in a hurry. Like other countries normally go through the, let's go through the uh, forums, let's go through social media. You have these waves of progress. For us, everything just happened in one go. Um, and also journalists don't tend to last. Um, good ones don't tell the last. An example I put here is Lassanda Vikramatunga, 1998, anti-tax shells were fired on his house. 2000, 2002, the government tried to sue him. 2008, the president threatened to kill him. Uh, 2009, he was shot dead by four assassins on motorcycles. Good journalists don't last in our country. This is how bad the news is. This is a paper called Divina. They're one of the oldest in the country. NASA reported basic building blocks of life found on Mars. Divina reported this as blocks found, like building blocks found on Mars. They actually drew a helpful circle around what I presume are the blocks found on Mars. This is net news covering the coronavirus. Rather, um, this is the case of Dr. Shafi, where uh, this is a case of ethnic tension coming out where a prominent Muslim surgeon was accused of having sterilized 5,000 Sinhalese women. Uh, how the case went was you ha he had rivals in the hospital who then took that to the police, took that to Divina, the paper that I was talking about, and these are all mainstream papers. These are print media. We're not even at social media yet. Uh, they went completely behind the backs of the police and so on and so forth. They turned the initial claim of which was about 100 women sterilized into 5,000. They printed that as headline news. The man's career was completely ruined. The CID did a thorough investigation. They found absolutely no truth to the claims whatsoever. Nobody came forward, but you know, papers had already printed it. Damage was done. Um, we have, I mean, this is a case of us monitoring the fallout of that 154 videos were produced, thousands of comments, 1.86 million aggregated views across this stuff. It was as if an entire empire just went into production overnight. So this is the default Sri Lankan ecosystem. Uh, Dr. Shafi is still in hot water, honestly. He's still battling the court system and the criminal investigative department in, well, if you are suspect, it's not an easy thing to get out of. So by the numbers, um, Google is the most visited site in Sri Lanka, then YouTube. Facebook is actually number four. And then you have number five, Hero FM, which is what I was talking about. Yahoo, ikmang.lk is an e-commerce website. Wikipedia, ex hamster, of course, people need to take care of their needs. And number 10, Gossip Lanka. So you have an interesting idea that YouTube is actually more prominent than Facebook in spreading some of this news. What this doesn't actually cover is that WhatsApp and Viber are even more prominent in this media ecosystem. Uh, how the government has traditionally dealt with hate speech is by blocking. Um, say, Take away, the, take away Facebook, and then everybody, we had this period where uh, 2018, March 2018, we had a Buddhist mob that burned down a bunch of Muslim houses in Kandy. Government responded by blocking social media, saying that's where the hate is. Same thing happened post, uh, post terror bombings. And of course, um, the New York Times and various other 
The American media had a field day saying, oh, this is wonderful, government has finally taken action. What they're not seeing is, is, that, the government's, is that our government was effectively offloading responsibility and saying, well, this is, this is their fault and not ours. It's a dangerous policy stance to take because what we should have done was had proper policy on how to deal with this stuff, had proper, uh, we do have something called the ICCPR Act 56 of 2007, which says that any incitement to, uh, to violence based on racial hatred will be met with a 10 year sentence. However, some of the people actually putting forth this stuff happened to me um, in parliament at the moment. So we have a system of laws that are not necessarily implemented and it is dangerous to allow a government like that to potentially offload uh, some of the fallout. So let's talk about what some of these operations look like in Sri Lanka. Um, this is what we call the classic approach. Sorry. Oh, right. This is what we call the classic approach. Um, most media, the most classical traditional print media in Sri Lanka, are owned either by um, a parliamentarian, the wife of a parliamentarian, the brother of a parliamentarian, the cousin of a parliamentarian. That is most print media, most radio, most broadcast, anything that has spectrum rights. Is generally, you can expect uh, someone in parliament at the end of it. That's what we think of as a classical approach. However, these are now old hat. Uh, well, so they've, they've actually realized that, you know, having control of the TV is not necessarily enough. And some of these, most of these very old school media companies have now started building YouTube channels, which massive amounts of hits. This is uh, from our YouTube monitor. And we're looking at how many views these things get. So TV, Derna, Swarnavahini, Sri Lanka, Cricket, Hiru TV, Hiru News, other there. Now these are all News First, Sirasa TV. These are all very classic broadcasting corporations that are now shifting to YouTube. Um, so that's part of the classic approach. Let's talk about the modern approach. This is the modern approach. Number one, YouTube creators. This is, uh, I have no compunctions putting this up because this is a public figure. Um, UNP uh, is a political party. In a country. Um, it is notably a bit more liberal than the side that Iraj, who is the man in the red dress there, uh, it's a bit more liberal than the party that he espouses. So before the elections, he put out this music video that basically uh, made fun of transgender groups, made fun of the UNP. Uh, it got 2.38 uh, million views. Um, and after that, he was made a director of the Board of Tourism after the election was won. So that's, <coughs> that's generally a new approach, right. Part two, influencers on Instagram. So you find accounts like this, like the Salon account, which have rather interesting patterns. You find scenery, 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 president of Sri Lanka, scenery, 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 scenery. Um, that is part of the Instagram approach. Number three is Twitter bots. Twitter, I didn't initially believe there was much to it because we have, what, about 90,000 people on Twitter? Twitter is a very small network for us. But somewhere in 2018, about 5,000 bots appeared on Sri Lankan Twitter. And I started, I was basically bored and we started looking through them. So once we'd identified these 5,000 bots, you know, identifying the bot itself tells you nothing. Sure, there are bots, so what? But we started looking at who the bots followed and looked at 200,000 tweets from the accounts that the bots followed to see if we could figure out some of the hunting logic of these bots. And what we found was that the bots were hunting anyone who had, let's say, socio-political influence, not necessarily coded by officially being politicians, but people who were known in certain aspects of society to have the ear of someone important or clout. So it was clearly a rather localized operation that was being run. This is also happening. Um, but of course, all of this, like I said, pales compared to WhatsApp. This is... Um, Watchdog, I woke, that's me waking up at 12, 16 a.m. These are people sending us fake news. Uh, there's one guy saying, fuck you. Um, but this is until at nine o'clock I went back to sleep again. But from there to here, that's basically the amount of messages we get a day. Uh, people sending us stuff going, is this true? My mother said this. Uh, you know, someone, someone from like my third cousin's uncle's grandfather's dog said this or whatever. You get all of this stuff just funneled in. Um, then you have Telegram, which I think we touched on earlier. There are these rather interesting groups on Telegram. Now, this particular group um, has 1.7, well, 1.78K members. It started in March 2018. 
It has since then consistently been producing memes and material which then eventually appear on all these Facebook meme pages on WhatsApp as well. This in particular is a meme of um, the brigadier who in the London office pointed to an LTT, uh, a pro-LTT um, protest and pointed at them and did this, which is rather kind of stupid if you are a government official and you are representing the government of Sri Lanka, you do not go around uh, doing this to random bystanders. 21,000, well, that's, that's uh, this is one of the groups, one of the more minor groups, so this one has produced 2,159-ish photos that I've archived as of this morning, and 109 videos. This has been running consistently since March 2018. We know who runs it, uh, just not something that can be talked about in public. But there are these operations, so there's Telegram, that stuff appears on WhatsApp, that stuff even then gets picked up by the gossip sites or by mainstream media. Then you see Facebook, and there's a tier to how information propagates. So, well. So I think that uh, this question, yes. what do we do about it? Somebody has to promise me to ask to you, Doctor. Yes, oh, I think, we shall ask I think because I'm far past my time limit, yeah. I'll think I'll just stop here, and I'll leave it on to the next. Thank you.